this Warmaster video we shall discuss topics not previously covered, such as how the game ends, and also the many optional rules available. Page 69 of the rulebook offers three alternative ways that a game of Warmaster may end. Firstly, both players may choose to play a set number of turns each, with the game ending once both players have had this requisite number of turns. Alternately, play may end when one player concedes. And this is the same as tipping your king in chess. If you can't see a way forward, you can end the game and hand a victory to your opponent. However, the most common method by which a game of Warmaster will end is when one player is forced to withdraw. An army will be forced to withdraw in one of two ways. Firstly, if the general of an army is removed from play, either because they are slain or because they're forced to leave the table for good, then the army will withdraw. And secondly, an army will be forced to withdraw if it suffers excessive casualties. The withdrawal point of an army is equal to half or more of its total number of units, and this is most commonly referred to as the army's break point. Once the break point is reached, the game ends. And this can happen at any point during a player's turn, whenever a unit is removed as a casualty, which brings the army to its break point. Note that it is only units which count towards the break point, not characters. Once a unit has lost all of its stands, it counts as one point towards the army's break point. However, if a unit which began the game with three or more stands is reduced to one stand, then this counts as half a point towards the army's break point. However, a unit which begins the game with two stands or only a single stand never counts as half a break point. A two stand or one stand unit must be completely removed from play to count as one break point. Let's see how this works. Here we have the casualties that have been removed from play from a battle. All of these units began the game with three stands. On the left hand side we can see that four of the units have lost all three of their stands, while on the right hand side one unit has lost two stands and two units have lost one stand each. So in terms of counting towards the army's break point, four units add one and one unit adds a half for a total of four and a half. In this example we can see that five units have lost all three of their stands which adds five towards the army's break point. On the left three units have only lost a single stand and they add nothing towards the army's break point. Note that even though one of these units began the game with only two stands, in this case the cannon, it still adds nothing to the army's break point because it's only lost a single stand. In this example we can see that three units have lost all three of their stands, adding one point towards break, whilst two units have lost two out of their three stands and each adds half a point towards break, for a total of four. When you build your army list you must make a note of the army's break point, which will be half the total number of units in the army, rounding up. For example, if you have 20 units in the army your break point will be 10, but if you have 21 units your break point will be 11. At the start of each of your turns it's worth discussing with your opponent how near to breaking both armies are, as this will often influence the tactical choices you both make during that turn. Once the game has ended, and assuming that one player did not concede, then the winner is determined by calculating victory points. If one player concedes, then they score no victory points. If both players reach their turn limit, but neither side has been forced to withdraw, victory points are used to determine the winner. Whereas if one side was forced to withdraw, then you also use victory points to determine the winner. Although if your army is forced to withdraw, then your victory point total can never be higher than your opponent's, so the best you can hope for is a draw. To work out how many victory points you have scored, simply add up the points values of all enemy units which have been removed from play. Any unit which has lost all of its stands gives up its entire points value, while units which started the game with three or more stands, and have been reduced down to one single stand remaining, give up half their total points value as victory points. And in the case of odd numbers, round any fractions up to the nearest five points. For example, a 45 point unit reduced down to a single stand will give up 25 victory points. 
Any characters that have been removed as casualties also give up their full points, including the cost of any mounts. Also, don't forget to add the cost of any magic items carried by a unit or a character to their victory point total. A unit which began the game with one or two stands only must be completely destroyed to earn any victory points at all. Whoever scores the most victory points wins. If both players score the same, it's a draw. Now of course, if you wish, you can do away with the concept of victory points entirely, especially if you're playing a scenario. In which case you can set a predetermined victory condition for either army, and as soon as one player reaches that condition, they win the game. And this system is most often used by tournament organisers in order to ensure that games of Warmaster do not drag on for inordinate lengths of time. In my games I do enjoy using the victory point system, because even if you are forced to withdraw, if you've caused enough damage to the enemy, you will be rewarded with a well-earned draw. Games of Warmaster are designed to be played on a 6 foot by 4 foot table which is roughly 180 by 120 centimetres. This size board will easily accommodate between 2 and 4,000 points of armies per side. When deploying armies, you must ensure that there is at least an 80 centimetre gap between both sides, as this ensures that the player who takes the first turn doesn't have an unfair advantage in getting the first charge off. When it comes to placing scenery, it's best to deploy all the scenery on the board before you know which player is going to be on which side. And once the battlefield scenery is set up to your mutual satisfaction, you can roll off to decide who picks which board edge. Before you set up any troops, it's worth discussing with your opponent what each type of terrain actually is, and double check the rules for each terrain type, as this will avoid confusion and disagreement later on. When deploying your armies, there are a variety of methods you can use. For example, you could alternate setting up one unit or one brigade of units at a time, starting with the player that chose the board edge. Alternately, one player could draw a map, showing where their army will deploy. Their opponent can then deploy on the battlefield before the person who drew the map deploys according to their map. Or finally, you could use the optional scouting rules for deployment, which we'll cover later. Also note that many Warmaster scenarios will change the deployment rules entirely. For example, one army might have to set up completely before the other, and they might be in defence of a village or guarding a wagon train. I mentioned earlier how the game may be lost if the general leaves the board and does not return, but how do units actually leave the board in games of Warmaster? Well, units may be subject to some kind of compulsory movement, such as when they're driven back by enemy missile fire, or when they retreat or fall back from combat. And if any characters are attached to a unit which is subject to this compulsory movement, then they will move with them. And this can result in units and characters leaving the board. In this example, the unit of birdmen shoot their missile weapons at the unit of harpies and this results in the harpies being driven back directly away from the birdmen and off the board. The rules state that as soon as any part of any stand from a unit leaves the board, the entire unit is assumed to have left the board. If the unit that leaves the board is retreating from combat, then it is assumed to have been destroyed, in the same way that a retreating unit is destroyed if it contacts impassable terrain. In all other circumstances, a unit which leaves the board must roll a d6 and consult the following table. For every stand of the unit which has already been destroyed, you deduct 1 from the dice roll. If the modified roll is 0 or less, then the unit is considered to be destroyed, along with any attached characters, so if this was the general's unit, the game ends. On the roll of 1 or 2, the unit leaves the table, but may reappear again at the start of its own turn in which case you should position the unit which has just left the table at the table edge with the same facing and in the same formation as it just left. You then get to roll again on this same table at the start of the unit's next turn. The bad news is that if the general was attached to this unit he counts as having withdrawn from the battle. On the roll of 3 or 4 the unit reappears on the table edge at the point which it just left but it cannot move further that turn the unit must retain the same formation and the same facing it had when it left. 
while on the roll of a 5 or 6, the unit reappears on the table edge in the same way as the roll of 3 or 4, with the same facing and formation as it left, but the unit is allowed to move further that turn. So if this has just happened at the start of the turn, the unit can use its initiative or receive orders. Since the publication of Warmaster Revolution, a number of questions have been asked about specific rules, and wherever there's any ambiguity, the author of Warmaster Revolution, Alish Navratil, has published an answer on his website. These questions and answers are free to download, so let's take a look at them now. The first question concerns units retreating into woodland. Woodland terrain restricts the line of sight of units to 2 cm. Units are not normally allowed to pursue an enemy they cannot see. So what happens when an enemy unit retreats more than 2 cm into woods? Can it be pursued? The answer is yes they can, as the inference is that a pursuing unit will not stand idly by while its opponent disappears amongst the trees, it will be actively chasing them. The next question concerns flying units which are locked into an unresolved combat. Are they allowed to home back? And the answer is no. Once you're locked into an unresolved combat, you have to fight that combat in the combat phase, so you're not allowed to escape by homing back. The third question relates to the raise dead spell. Are there any restrictions when placing the summoned unit of skeletons into a combat? And the answer is yes you are not allowed to place the summoned unit of skeletons so that it would split one combat engagement into two separate combat engagements. For example, if the undead are fighting engaged enemy infantry units in line formation, one supporting the other, you're not allowed to raise dead behind the rear line of supporting infantry, as this would negate their support and force them to turn around to fight you, thus splitting the combat. The fourth question concerns the demonic instability table, especially the roll of a 6. When a demon unit does roll a 6 on its instability chart, it instantly ceases to be confused. In addition, it must charge the nearest visible enemy unit in the same manner as an initiative charge. If no enemy unit is visible and in charge range, the unit doesn't charge. The next question relates to the dwarf flame cannon. What happens if you stand and shoot with the flame cannon and you roll a misfire which causes it to blow up? The answer is you work out the combat as normal but then the flame cannon counts as being destroyed in the first round. The final question relates to the Araby Mirage spell. What happens when a unit charges the Mirage? Can the charging unit move again? The answer is it depends on how it charged. If it charged using initiative then no it cannot move again. However, if it charged as a result of an order, then it is permitted to receive another order, and therefore can move again. You can read this Q&A for yourself by following the link below to Alish's website. All of these questions and answers will be incorporated into an updated version of the Compendium Rulebook and the Army Lists book over the course of the year. So make sure you check into Alish's website every year to ensure you have the most up-to-date version of the Warmaster Revolution Compendium rule set. The rules and the army lists are all free to download and you can find them on the link below. Now let's take a look at some of the optional rules which were introduced by Warmaster Revolution. To use these rules both opponents must agree as they fall outside the scope of the core rulebook. If you attend a tournament, then the organiser will clearly state at the start which optional rules are in effect. The first optional rule is moving after a failed command. If the first order issued to a unit or brigade in the command phase is not successful, then the unit or brigade is allowed a half-paced move, provided they don't change formation. The unit is not allowed to charge, and flyers are restricted to a 10 cm move. If this first order was failed with the roll of double six, then you resolve the blunder instead. Or if the general rolled a double six, there is no blunder, instead the unit doesn't move at all, and the command phase ends. So this rule was introduced to prevent the phenomenon where armies could sit there and do nothing for turn after turn due to a string of poor command rolls. By granting a unit or brigade 
a half pace move if their first order of the turn is failed, it permits the army some degree of reactionary movement. So you may not be able to get your troops to do exactly what you want, but they're not just going to sit there idly. And this has proved to be a very popular optional rule, especially amongst greenskin players. Note that this optional rule has no effect on a unit's second or third order of the turn. The second optional rule is first order. And this grants every character a plus one bonus to their command value for their first order of the game. So this is a one-time bonus which will only take effect in your army's first turn. No character's command value can exceed 10 through this optional rule. And it has been introduced to represent an army's better organisation and communication at the start of a battle. It's another popular change. And don't worry, I've spotted that it actually says leadership and not command. This is being addressed and the rule will be updated to say command later this year. So until then, you can play it as it's intended. The third optional rule is charging flyers. This restricts the charge move of a flying unit to 60 centimeters instead of 100 centimeters. And this was introduced to reduce the threat posed by flyers to vulnerable units such as artillery pieces, as flying units now need to be within potential threat range of the enemy in order to charge them. The fourth optional rule is partially defended units. This can be applied to units of infantry or artillery who have some of their stands in a defended position and others not in a defended position. For example, an infantry unit may have two stands behind an obstacle and one stand in the open. A partially defended unit still counts as defended so the enemy will hit them on a 5+, plus. but if the partially defended unit is charged then the enemy is still allowed to claim any additional attacks from charge bonus. This rule is designed to speed up combat, whereas otherwise you would have to work out the combat on a stand-by-stand -stand basis, as some stands would be defended and others not. However, this rule is open to exploitation, as an infantry unit of three stands could simply place the corner of one of its stands in defensible terrain, such as a wood, and then the entire unit of three stands would count as partially defended against enemy charges. Note that this optional rule only applies against enemy charges and not against enemy missile fire. In the case of missile fire, you always work out your unit's shots against the closest visible enemy stand, which will either be defended or in the open. The fifth optional rule is flank and rear charges and pursuit. And this permits units of cavalry, chariots or flyers to be pursued for one round of combat if they've been charged in the flank or rear by units that can't normally pursue them. So for cavalry and chariots this would normally be infantry. Now, as I previously mentioned in my video on combat results, infantry cannot pursue into front edge-to-edge -edge contact with retreating cavalry or chariots from the same combat but infantry are allowed to pursue into the flanks or rear of retreating cavalry or chariots from the same combat. So this optional rule limits the infantry pursuit of cavalry and chariots to one round only, and therefore permits these types of units to survive an infantry trap, as the infantry won't be able to pursue them if they retreat in the second round. The same principle also applies to retreating flying units and pursuing non-flyers. The next optional rule is the trial rule for light cavalry, which is currently found at the end of the Armies book. They are designed to enhance the role of light cavalry units on the battlefield, and add an additional tactical role for these type of troops, by making them more difficult to pin down in combat. To qualify for these trial rules, the unit must be cavalry, it must have an armour save no greater than 6+, plus, and it must have some form of shooting attack. The trial rules further differentiate between light cavalry with a 30cm range and light cavalry with a 15cm range on their shooting attack. Currently there are four types of units in Warmaster that are cavalry with 30cm shooting attacks and a 6-up save. And they are High Elf Reavers, Bretonian Squires, Dark Elf Dark Riders and Wood Elf Glade Riders and functionally they are all the same unit, with a very similar stat line and points cost, which is a good example of consistency of units across army lists. Under the trial rules, these type of units 
can use their initiative to evade in any direction. They don't have to move directly away from the closest visible enemy unit, although they still have to move in a straight line. In some circumstances this can even result in the light cavalry evading behind the unit they're evading from. And it nicely represents this type of unit's excellent mobility. The other type of light cavalry are units with a 15cm shooting attack. And currently this includes wolf riders from the orc list and the goblin list, Kislev horse archers, Araby desert riders, dogs of war light cavalry and chaos dwarf hobgoblin wolf riders. And hopefully one day we might be able to add beastman centigors to this list. And once again you can see that these units are functionally the same with very similar stat lines and points costs. All of these unit types have the same evasion rules as previously mentioned. Additionally, light cavalry units with the 15cm shooting attack gain another rule, and that is that if they're engaged in the front by an enemy unit, in close combat, then regardless of who charged, if the light cavalry lose combat and retreat, then they can only be pursued by other light cavalry units, so cavalry with a shooting attack and a 6 plus save, or by flyers or units that can pursue any enemy. This allows light cavalry to intercept enemy heavy cavalry, as they can hold them up and then retreat without fear of pursuit. Just remember that if you've been charged in the flank or the rear, this optional rule will not apply. The next optional rule is the scouting rules for deployment. If you choose to use this rule, then before you begin the game, you must assign any number of your units and characters in your army to be scouts. Each unit or character will have a scouting value, which is determined by the table below. Once you have picked your scouting units for the army, you determine your total scouting value, and then roll 2d6 and add your scouting value to the result. Note that you don't have to pick any units to be scouts at all, in which case your scouting result is just the 2d6 roll. Whoever scores highest wins the scouting contest. The winner then has to deploy all their scouting units and scouting characters within their deployment zone on the battlefield, and they get to choose which board edge to deploy on. Note that if you've picked any ambushing units to be your scouts, they don't have to deploy at the start of the game. Once the player who won the scouting role has deployed all of his scouting units and characters, the character that lost the scouting role then deploys his entire army in his deployment zone, and after this the player that won the scouting role deploys his remaining troops in his deployment zone. Scouting is therefore always a bit of a gamble. It's always good to try and force the opponent to deploy his entire army before you. However, if you commit too many of your units and characters to be scouts, then if you win the scouting role, you will actually be deploying a lot more of your army first, which may be counterproductive. It's also worth noting that some armies are inherently better at scouting than others. For example, the Ogres, the Norse, the Skaven and the Empire will find it quite hard to generate a decent scouting value, whereas the Wood Elves can routinely generate a scouting value of over 20 without really trying. So let's take a look at what units and characters contribute to the scouting value. So unsurprisingly the best scouts are flying units, or characters mounted on a flying steed. Any character or unit of flyers has a scouting value of 3. And this category also includes Wood Elf Waywatcher units. The next best type of scouting unit are Cavalry, with a 6-up or no save at all, and this does include units of Hounds. This type of Cavalry has a scouting value of 2 per unit. Also included in this category are units of Dwarf Rangers, Skaven Gutter Runners, Vampire Count's Ethereal Hosts, Wood Elf Dryads, Beastman Centigors and Ogre Yetis. Additionally, any Command 10 character not mounted on a flying steed will generate two scouting points. Moving down the list, the next type of scouts are Cavalry with a 5 plus armor save. And each of these Cavalry units will generate one scouting point. This category also includes Wood Elf Glade Guard. And any non flying character with a command value of 9. The final type of scouting unit is infantry with a shooting attack and no armour save or a 6 plus armour save. And each of these units adds half a point towards your scouting value. 
This category also includes any non-flying Command 8 characters. The scouting rules are a popular addition to Warmaster as they generally speed up deployment. There are also advanced rules for terrain pieces, which expand upon the basic terrain types described in the rulebook and promote the diversity of terrain types on the battlefield. I've already covered this in a previous video and I will include the link to that video here. But this now concludes my video on the miscellaneous rules from the rulebook and the optional rules for Warmaster. It also marks the end of my Welcome to Warmaster series. As always, if you spot something which I have missed, or something which you feel I've misinterpreted from the rulebook, please let me know in the comments below. And if you've watched the entire series of 10 videos, congratulations, as that is over 5 hours of information. Warmaster is an evolving game, and as changes to the rules or the army lists occur, I will publish further videos explaining these updates as soon as they are in the public domain. The Warmaster Revolution Rules Committee does regularly trawl the Experimental Rules Forum for new ideas, and the best ideas will be incorporated into actual changes to the rules after a lengthy and rigorous playtesting process. So it's entirely possible that a concept that you might come up with will be the subject of a future video. Until then, don't forget I've also published a complete faction focus video series and I will also continue to produce battle report videos. You can find links to these playlists below.